You need not say goodbye. The people will shout my name. Pilate will tell them there's nothing I've done to deserve this, but they will refuse. Pilate will stand me beside Barabbas, a murderer, and they will choose him over me. Pilate will appeal to the priest, insist on simply whipping me to appease their fury, but they will shout it louder, crucify, crucify. But still, you need not say goodbye. My hands will be tied to a post. The sound of the whip will ring in your ears and in your chest. The soldiers will peel the skin off my back. A ring of thorny branches will be pressed into my scalp until the blood runs into my eyes. Oh, but listen, you need not say goodbye. I will carry that cross. I will go to the place of the skull and there they will drive the iron stakes between the bones in my wrist. With a hammer, they will nail my feet into the tree. I will be raised up as the world waits for me to die. Nevertheless, you need not say goodbye. Between two thieves, I will hang. You may hear me speaking to my father your father. You may hear me ask him, why? But child, you need not say goodbye. What you won't see, what you won't hear, what you won't know until all of this is done is that in that moment, I was paying the penalty of your wrongdoing, every wrongdoing, every mistake, Every act of envy, every word of hatred, every moment of violence and greed and spite, every selfish desire, every lustful thought, every moment of weakness and weariness, all the failures of human history will be in my hands and on my head. On that cross, I will suffer the wrath that was destined for you. Every guilty verdict fallen on me, your punishment will be paid for in my blood and it will be enough. I will die on your cross. I will let out a final sigh. Know that I have loved you and you need not say goodbye. But if you must, if you absolutely must say the word goodbye, then say it like this. Goodbye fear. Goodbye sorrow. Goodbye rejection. Goodbye shame. Say it like this. Goodbye guilt. Goodbye condemnation. Goodbye all the regrets of the past. Look up at the cross and speak the words. Goodbye addiction. Goodbye chains. Goodbye hopelessness. Right here in this place, say it aloud. Goodbye captivity. Hello freedom. Goodbye loneliness. Hello belonging. Goodbye defeat. Hello victory. This is the end of the curse. This is the demise of the serpent. This is all debts paid. This is, it is finished. Goodbye all the powers of hell. Goodbye darkness. Goodbye dread. Goodbye every sin. Go ahead and say it. Goodbye death. Speak and be free, but don't say goodbye to me. Yes, you'll see them put the spear in my side, but remember, it's only Friday, so you need not say goodbye.
Good Friday is one of the most interesting days because it, it has a unique tension to it. On the one hand, Jesus Christ suffered deeply. He suffered, was uh, beaten, was crucified in a very unbelievable fashion, one that uh, was designed to bring ultimate agony to its victim. And in that sense, we reflect and we pause and we're humbled and we're heartbroken. In another sense, what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross through his suffering actually provided for us something amazing. It provided us a relationship with God, and that is good news. So today, here on Good Friday, and then on Easter Sunday for our messages for, on Easter throughout the weekend, we are going to be doing a series simply titled, entitled The Good News. On Sunday, on Easter Sunday, and um, when that's broadcast, we'll be talking about the good news of Easter. Today, I want to talk to you about the good news of the cross. So take out your notes, and we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. If you have a Bible or you have uh, uh, access to that text, open to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. How many of you need some good news today? How many of you need some encouragement? How many need to have your chin lifted up, to have your heart buoyed, your, your soul stirred to a positive direction, and you just need to break from the negativity and from all that wants to bring us down. If that's you, uh, the good news of the cross is especially for you. Not only is it you, it represents how 2,000 years ago some Hebrew Christians felt about their life. A little bit of background to the book of Hebrews in general and then Hebrews 12 in particular. Hebrews was written to encourage Jewish Christians not to turn their back on Jesus and go back to their old way of life. In their particular situation, their old way of life was Old Testament Judaism devoid of Jesus Christ. They were suffering, they were going through hardship, and they felt that they had not had the suffering and hardship before they became followers of Jesus Christ. And they were right, because sometimes when you become a Christian, while God gives you the strength and the power to overcome everything, sometimes, many times, oftentimes, in some form or fashion, life will actually get harder because you have new enemies, particularly the devil. And so he was trying to discourage them, and they were discouraged. And the, the book of Hebrews was written to do two things. Number one, to provide warning. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, there are five classic warnings to say, don't turn back. But it was also written to provide encouragement, encouragement to press on, encouragement that following Jesus Christ is the right thing, even if at times it's discouraging and hard and difficult. And the same message for the Hebrews 2,000 years ago is the same message we need today. And after he gives these warnings, he works through the chapters and he talks about the superiority of Jesus. That's the theme of Hebrews, the superiority of Jesus. By the way, I'm considering next year uh, at Midweek Bible Study for the 2021 year, I'm thinking about doing the book of Hebrews. I did it around 11 years ago. I think it speaks today. So I'm thinking about that. But in the, the book, he, he provides encouragement, encouragement. In chapter 11, one of the ways he provides encouragement is to remind them of all the Old Testament heroes, Abraham, Moses, Noah, et cetera, et cetera, and how they were examples of looking forward to the faith of Christ, and they longed to see that day. And then based on Hebrews 11, he writes Hebrews 12 to build on that. So at the top of your notes, let's read Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Look at what it says. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now that refers almost certainly to the people in Hebrews chapter 11, many who are the hero, all of them who are the heroes of faith, some who even suffered toward the end of Hebrews 11. You'll read about that. Since we have this great cloud of witnesses, these heroes of the previous chapter, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. By the way, we each have a unique race marked out for us. You might run a 100-yard dash. 
Uh, some of you might run, might run the marathon and all points in between, but God has a special race for you and for me. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now in this passage, we're going to see this tension, the tension between Christ's sacrifice and suffering on Good Friday and our good news and encouragement as a result of Christ's suffering and sacrifice on the cross. So what I want to do is I want to look at the good news of Good Friday and see what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ has done. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, three great things were provided for us. I see them in this uh, section of Hebrews. I see one in, chat, in verse 1, I see one in verse 2, and I see a third in verse 3. So three things that provide good news. Here's the first. Because of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we can win with him over every sin. We can win with him over every sin. In verse 1 it says, since we have the witnesses of Hebrews chapter 11 that remind us of how Jesus is so much better than our former life, our old life. This is speaking to those who have become Christians, your life before you became a Christian. He says, let us throw off all the sin that entangles us. Let us, let us shed it. Let us get rid of it. Let us just get it out of our lives because it entangles us and it just traps us and causes us to stumble. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, sin was defeated in two significant ways. You can write this down if you want. First, sin was defeated in this sense. The penalty of sin can be eliminated. When you become a Christian, you are so forgiven of past, present, and future sin that there is no more cause for God to judge you for it. And because of that, the penalty of sin, Romans says the wages or penalty of sin is death. I'm not talking about just physical death, but it's talking about eternal death in the afterlife, that penalty has been eliminated, has been waived because of the cross. That's exciting. We can win over every sin because the penalty of sin has been taken care of by Christ. But the second thing that um, the payment of Jesus Christ on the cross did for us is it took away the power of sin. The power of sin can be blunted. And that's what I think he's talking about here in verse 1. The penalty of sin is implied, but more overtly, the power of sin is what he's talking about in verse 1. He has the idea that, John, that Jesus talked about in John 8, 36, where he says, When I, Jesus Christ, the Son, sets you free, you are free indeed. You are absolutely free. Free in what sense? You're free to not have to live as a slave to sin. If you read John chapter 8 in the verses that surround um, starting around verse 32, it says, Jesus says, everybody who sins is a slave to sin. Did you know that? Before you became a Christian, you were a slave to sin. No, I'm free. I could do whatever I want. Of course, and you'll always choose sin. You're a slave to sin. Every person before they become a Christian is enslaved to sin. But Jesus Christ sets us free to win over every sin. We no longer have to be its slave. Sin is no longer our slave master. Our new master is Jesus Christ. So that's what he means. And that's why the author says we can throw off every single sin that hinders us and entangles us. What sins do you struggle with? What is going on in your life that you go, how could I win over this? Here's the good news. You can win over over every sin. I don't care what the sin is. I don't care how deep it is. I don't care if it came when you were a kid. I don't care if you've been in it for 20, 30, 50, 100 years. It doesn't matter. There is no sin that you have to be beholden to. This text tells us that the cross says, the good news of the cross is we can win over every sin. Here's the second thing. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross on Good Friday, a second thing is uh, called to our attention in Hebrews chapter 12. This time in verse 2, it says this, we can focus on him for encouragement. We can focus on him for encouragement. In verse 2, it says, let us run with perseverance by fixing our eyes on Jesus, by fixing our eyes on Jesus, by laser locking 
on Jesus, every aspect of Jesus, certainly, but he's going to call to attention the most significant aspect of Christ's life that will give us the encouragement we need, and that's his sacrifice on the cross. Because Christ went to the cross and suffered so, he offers us the encouragement we need when our life gets discouraging. As it did for the Hebrews then, it does for us now. He told them about it you know, a little over 1,900 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, to encourage them. And he does it today because the scriptures encouraged people then. And as the scriptures, the Bible says, was also, were also written to provide for us our own encouragement. Now, how so? Now, I see three ideas in this second idea. In verse 2, I see three sections to verse 2. Here's how he provides encouragement. Number one, or letter A, he will perfect our faith over time. The text says that Jesus Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the author, that is, he starts our faith. You couldn't believe in Jesus Christ until Christ gave you the grace to believe in him first. He is the author of our faith. He starts it. He writes our faith story. And then it says he is the perfecter of our faith. This means he completes it. So when he says the author says he's the author and perfecter of our faith. It means he begins it and he will complete it. This is a source of encouragement. I think of that verse in Philippians 1.6 where, where Paul writes, I am confident of this, that he, Jesus Christ, who began a good work in you when you became a Christian, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, it is sure to succeed. It is sure to complete. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. That's the first source of encouragement. The second source I see, letter B in your notes, is this. He has provided the perfect model. The perfect model. Look at what it says in the middle section of verse 2. He says, For the joy set before him, Christ endured the suffering and the shame of the cross. Just like Christ suffered on the cross and endured because he knew the results would be provision for human beings, satiating and satisfying the just requirements of his father. We endure tough times knowing the results for us. Eternity in heaven. Just like Christ saw the cross but then saw beyond the cross and that helped him find encouragement in the cross, we go through hardships in life and we don't focus on the hardships of life as much, or at least we shouldn't, as much as the reward of heaven at the end of it. Jesus models this for us as the perfect model that he saw past the cross to what it would accomplish. We see past the trials and the discouragement and the suffering and the perseverance needed to the reward, which is heaven. And by the way, depending on how faithful you are in this life, that determines your reward in heaven. Becoming a Christian gives you eternal life in heaven. How faithful you are the moment you become a Christian for the rest of your life determines your rewards in heaven when you get there. That's encouraging. And then third, the text says in letter C in your outline, he is positioned to help with authority. The passage, verse 2, I should say, ends with this. Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That picture, here's, if you can picture it, here's God the Father on the throne and Jesus Christ at his right hand. It has the picture of authority. When Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God, it's a picture of authority. Now, no offense to anybody who's left-handed, but in the Bible, the right hand is always considered the favored side and the left hand is considered the unfavored side. Now, that's not to suggest if you're left or right-handed, God loves you more or less. It's just a picture in the scripture. And when his Christ is at the right hand of God, it's like that expression, he's God's right-hand man. And he's seated at a place on a throne next to God the Father, it is his authority. In fact, the Bible says that God the Father gave Jesus Christ all authority. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus Christ says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And that describes his plight, his status, his authority after the resurrection. Jesus had the authority to encourage us through our difficulties. What's discouraging you today? I know we all have cabin fever. I know you're worried about your jobs. Maybe some of you have been furloughed, laid off. Maybe you've even been um, terminated from your job. It's tough, and I don't want to downplay that. I don't want to talk trivial or be glib or give you simple cliches. I, I don't think you need that. I don't think that's helpful. But I do want to say this. Jesus has the authority to encourage you in your difficulties. 
If you fix your eyes on him, he will provide you with encouragement. That's the second aspect of the good news of the cross. One more, and that's this. Because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the third thing that it does is this. We can find in him the strength to endure. Look at verse 3. It says, Consider Christ's cross so you won't grow weary and you won't lose heart. Some of us sometimes have to endure tough times. Sometimes it's hard to be happy all the time. In fact, it's impossible. I think you can be joyful all the time, even if you're not happy all the time. And sometimes you just have to endure the trial. And what he's saying here, the author is saying here, is consider what Jesus Christ suffered. He suffered infinitely more than anybody ever has and any of us ever could. Think about this, physically, the suffering of Jesus Christ. It goes without speaking. The whipping and the flogging alone was agony. The suffering on the cross, being nailed to the cross, having the cross be a place where you suffered, where you're literally, possibly, his hands were crucified this way. Regardless, the suffering of the cross was a literal, slow, tortuous, painful suffocation. And, and the, you'd push yourself on the nails in your feet to get some air relief, but you could only do that so long, and then you'd come down. And it would be this death dance, as some scholars described it, between the agony of the pain in your body and the longing for another breath. Physically, he suffered infinitely. On top of that, spiritually, the Bible says he took upon himself the sin of the world. Think about it. At one moment, he took upon himself every sin by every person who has ever lived ever on the earth and even those who lived today thousands of years after his death and he took upon himself the sin of the world to satisfy God. Spiritually, he paid a stiff price. Not only that, relationally, Jesus Christ was separated from God the Father and this, I think, speaks to his humanity. Of course, Jesus Christ in his deity is one with the Father, but in his humanity, Jesus Christ in one of his amazing seven sayings on the cross said this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Could Jesus lie? No, that had to be the truth. So it was the truth that God the Father forsook him. Why? Many, many reasons. Maybe because of the sin of the world. Certainly that's a factor in it. But he suffered relational separation from the Father for a moment on the cross. So when you consider all of this suffering of Jesus Christ, why we love him so much, when you consider it, we find his strength not to grow weary, his encouragement not to lose heart when we think about him. We can find strength in him to endure when we think about what he endured and what we're enduring in comparison. What's got you weary? What's got you losing heart today? Through Christ, consider everything he went through for you and for me. You know, centuries ago on the south coast of China, um, high up on a hill overlooking the harbor of Macao, Portuguese settlers built a gigantic cathedral. They believed this cathedral would stand the test of time. They built it super strong, and on um, one of the front walls of the cathedral, they had a massive bronze cross that was built that stood high in the sky. A few years later, a typhoon hit that part of the world and the whole cathedral was wiped out except for the bronze cross that was built um, on that cathedral wall. Um, so all that stood was the bronze cross. Many, many centuries later, there was a shipwreck in that harbor, in the vicinity of that harbor. Most of the people in that shipwreck died. A few lived. One of the men who lived survived by hanging on to the wreckage. As he was hanging on to the wreckage, driftwood, whatever it was that kept him afloat, he was tossed and turned by the waves. He didn't know where he was. He was disoriented. He didn't know what way was what until he spotted the cross. He could see it off in a long distance, and he spotted the cross from a distance. The man's name was Sir John Bowring. Sir John Bowring. Eventually, using the cross as his orientation, he was able to guide his way and make his way to land and almost miraculously 
survived because he saw the cross and the cross was his point of orientation when everything else was taking his eyes somewhere else and everything else was disorienting and throwing him around. And as a result, he wrote an amazing historic hymn titled, In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Listen to some of these lyrics. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. The last stanza says this, when the woes of life o'ertake me, hopes deceive and fears annoy, never shall the cross forsake me, lo, it glows with peace and joy. Now John Bowring is simply telling us this, life will shipwreck you, it will try to, it will send you on the waves, it will turn you upside down, you will lose your orientation. And the message of this hymn and the message of the story of Sir John Bowring is this. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus, consider Jesus and the cross on Good Friday. And not only that, consider that three days later, he rose again from the grave to prove that everything he accomplished on Good Friday was true and authentic and powerful to save us. It can do the same thing for you. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the cross. When you get disoriented, come back. Focus in on the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the good news of the cross. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the good news of the cross. Thank you for this text in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. and all the ways it lets us know that you have provided so much good news because of your sacrifice on Good Friday. And I pray those of us who know you, Lord, are encouraged and will remember to fix our eyes on you. And I am sure, Lord, that there are people watching and listening that do not know what it means to have a personal relationship with you. And I wanna ask you with just your eyes closed and just thinking about this truth, I wanna ask you, have you ever begun a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You can't say you've always been a Christian. You can't ease into it. It's a definite uh, radical shift in your life. So, so strong that Jesus said you must be born again, a spiritual rebirth. If you are hungry for God, if you wanna know Jesus Christ on a personal level, say this, say, Jesus Christ, I believe that you're God. I know that I sin and I'm so sick and tired of my sin, and I'm so sorry for my sin. I realize now that you're the only one who could do something about my sin. You paid for my sin by dying on the cross like we just studied tonight, today. I pray that you will forgive me and come into my life. I invite you into my life by faith alone. And if you say it and mean it, then you have become a Christian. And Jesus Christ is your Savior and all the things that we talked about and so much more are yours. He is your Savior and God, and Good Friday is good news for you. Father, for those individuals who said that prayer, maybe somebody said it in their heart, encourage them to let us know about it and encourage them to know that they are secure in you. And Father, may this sacred, holy day, Good Friday, remind us to fix our eyes on you when we need good news. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a moment, we are going to be receiving communion together. And um, I, I know this is still a little strange for some of us as we're not together and we're kind of doing this from our own homes, but we are still going to partake in communion together virtually online. And um, I'd like you guys to maybe take this time to go get something that's going to represent both the bread and the wine. And, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want to I say this before we start is that with communion, this does nothing for you spiritually. Just because you have taken the bread and the juice in this case, that doesn't do anything for you spiritually. And what I mean by that is it doesn't change your standing before God. It doesn't change how he sees you according to the scriptures. But what it does do is what the scripture says is to do it in remembrance. It's, it's for us to remember the sacrifice, the very thing that we were remembering tonight on Good Friday, that his body was broken and beaten 
and he was crucified to a cross and that his blood was poured out. And every time we take the bread and, and drink the cup, as the scripture says, we remember his death. We remember what he did for us. So um, this would be a great opportunity for you guys to go find something that would both represent the bread and the wine um, that represents his body and his blood. And as that's happening and as you guys are doing that, um, I just want to first off say thank you so, so much for your continued generosity. Uh, even in the midst of a, of a global pandemic, we are still able to share the gospel in ways that I don't think we even thought of, and, and it just continues to go forward, and it's because of our partnership that we're able to do that. So I know on, on behalf of the entire Lakeshore staff and leadership, thank you so much for, for that continued generosity. And um, if you've come prepared tonight to worship through your tithes and offerings, this is going to be your opportunity to do that. We have many different ways that you can do it. You can go to lakeshorechurch.org and select Give. You can do it right there. If you have the Lakeshore app, which we really hope you do, um, you can open up the app and just click Give on there, and that'll that'll get you started. But we have a brand new way as well that, that you can also give your tithes and offerings, and that's text to give. So um, if you just text the word Give to this number, it's 585-332-5558. Just text the word Give and then the amount and uh, that'll get you all set and going. So we're trying to give you as many options as possible uh, for you to continue to partner with us, and we thank you again so, so much. Now, tonight is Friday. Tonight is is a night that we remember the amazing and, and um, incredible sacrifice that, that Jesus Christ made for us. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And we are going to be celebrating Easter this year online, and, and we want to invite you all to come back. Um, we're going to be broadcasting our services at 9, again at 11, and then 1 p.m., and then we're going to rebroadcast thereafter. And we'd love for you to join us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The story doesn't end where we are tonight. It, it's only getting started. And this is also a great opportunity for you to invite somebody, maybe somebody who's been hesitant for church for so many years. Listen, church looks very different right now, and it's just a simple text. Hey, would you watch with me? And they can watch um, anywhere, whether they're in a different state, another another country even. We can still all join in and worship and celebrate together. So um, as you have co- gotten your elements so that we can partake in, in communion together, I'm going to read this scripture. But before I do that, um, so something very important, and, and this is commanded in the scriptures, is that if you're not sure where you stand with God, if you're not sure of what your relationship looks like, or maybe you have some unconfessed sin in your heart, this is going to be your opportunity to, to kind of come before him and, and confess that. But, but if there's something stirring in you, you're just not sure, I'm going to ask that you, you just hang on for a few minutes and, and not participate in communion because scripture specifically says that and, and we want to we make sure that, that we're honoring that. In verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner would be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. He must examine himself and in doing so, to eat and drink the bread of the cup. So if you're not sure tonight, I just want to ask you to, to let this pass and just, just kind of hang out with us for a few minutes. Um, but as we, as we get started, I want to read earlier in that chapter. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, and it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you have that bread, we're, we're going to eat together right now. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray with me? Father, we are humbled and grateful as we remember the blood that was spilt tonight so long ago. Lord, we remember the fact that your body was broken, that it was beaten, tortured, that, Lord, the nails were driven through your hands and your feet. The crown of thorns lay upon your head and the blood streamed down. And, God, we remember that this was all done for the sake of love. This was all done for the sake of us. For, for we know what your word says, that, that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And Father, we receive these elements tonight remembering what had happened so long ago. Father, I pray that as we, as we leave the broadcast tonight, we would just let this sit in our minds just, just for a while, that you did this for us, that you did this for every single person watching. And God, we thank you. We remember that and we praise you for it. And Father, we just thank you for how you're going to continue to work in our lives and the forgiveness and the mercy that we have now experienced. We praise you, Jesus. And we lift this whole night to you. In his name we pray. Amen. a place where mercy reigns and never dies there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where you my sin washed white I owe to you I owe to you Jesus and there's a place with sin and shame a powerless my heart has peace with God and forgiveness for all the love I've ever found comes like a flood comes flowing down that the cross at the cross I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. Here my hope is found here on holy ground. open wide here you save my life here I bow down here I bow at the cross at the cross 
I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where you love red, red, and my sin wash white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Jesus, the Savior of the world. Your love. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.